We apologise for the short breaks in sound that may be heard during parts of this recording. This was due to a fault on the original recording machine, and we hope that it doesn't spoil your concentration on this sermon by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4, verses 22, 28, 29, and 30. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. We come back once more to a consideration of this extraordinary uh, event which took place in the synagogue of Nazareth. We've been looking at this incident for a number of Sunday evenings, and we've been doing so in this way. A very astounding thing happened in that synagogue. Our Lord, at the age of 30, set out on his public ministry. He went to John the Baptist and asked him to baptize him. And John did baptize him. And as our Lord was coming up out of the water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. And the word from heaven came saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then we are told that he was led or driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil forty days and forty nights. And then, having repulsed and defeated the enemy, we are told that he came back in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And then he went back to Nazareth, his hometown. And as his custom was, on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias, And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, that's to say chapter 61 of Isaiah's prophecy, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And then follows the 22nd verse. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. But then they began to say, Is not this Joseph's son? Or Jesus, who's uh, always been here with us, the carpenter. And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this prophet, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country, but I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Nan and the Syrian. And they all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. 
But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Now, there's our background, there's our setting. The thing I'm calling attention to is this. We began doing it last Sunday evening. This is surely a most amazing and extraordinary thing that the people of Nazareth gathered together in that synagogue should have behaved like this to one who had just told them that he had come to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He's come to give and to bring the most glorious blessings that men can ever imagine. And yet here they are thrusting him out of the city, trying to murder him in wrath and fury. Oh, I'm calling attention to it because, you see, there at the very outset of our Lord's ministry, the key seems to have been set for the whole of his ministry. The staggering thing that confronts us in the four Gospels is this, that when the Son of God came into this world, he was rejected. He was despised. He was rejected of men. They preferred a thief and a robber to him. The crowd cried away with him, crucify him. Their rulers conspired together in order to get rid of him. That's the thing we're confronted with. The very thing that these people did in the synagogue of Nazareth was done by the rulers and by the people. The, the fact that we have facing us everywhere in the New Testament is a cross, a gibbet and the Son of God nailed to it, crucified, slain, rejected of men. I'm calling attention to it because according to this word, this word of God, our eternal destiny depends upon our reaction and our response to this person. And you see, the New Testament makes it perfectly plain and clear that there are only two possible responses. We either believe in him or else we reject him. There's no neutrality possible. Not to believe in him is to reject him. Not to accept him and to deny yourself and take up your cross and to go after him means that you are definitely against him. He himself said so. It's the whole message of the New Testament. And according to this book, we've already considered it. If we don't realize before we die that this is the acceptable year of the Lord, there is nothing awaiting us but the day of vengeance of our God, final judgment and everlasting perdition. So you see this is the most, most momentous thing that a company of people such as ourselves this evening can ever consider. Now, here we've got, I say, the essence of the New Testament teaching with regard to this matter. Here are people who rejected him. He never went back there again. They had their opportunity. They never had it again. So, because of the momentous character of this question, because of the dread possibilities that are confronting us. Surely the most important thing for us to do is to discover if we can. What was it that made those people of Nazareth behave in that way? What was it that produced this sudden change in them? Because you notice that at first they bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. As I showed last Sunday evening, they were attracted by him. Their eyes were all fastened on him. They were hanging on his lips. What's he going to say? They said, isn't it marvelous? They saw something strange about him. And his gracious words, his wonderful exposition, his application of Isaiah's prophecy to himself. At first, they liked it, but in a moment, everything changes. And they begin to have their second thoughts, and they say, isn't this Joseph's son? And then you remember how he replied to that. And that filled them with wrath. And they tried to destroy him. Well, now the question is, I ask, what is it that makes people do that? 
What is it that accounts for the fact that there's anybody in the world tonight who isn't a Christian? With the world in its present predicament, in its appalling condition. Why is it that men and women won't turn to this? They've tried everything else. They've listened to all their prophets and philosophers and teachers. And nobody seems able to help. And the world is becoming increasingly a morass. And here is a way offered that will give deliverance. And yet men and women reject it and him with scorn and take to everything else. Why is it? That's the great question of the ages. What's the matter? Oh, I emphasize the tragedy of it. Because the tragedy is this. The one they tried to throw down from the brown of that hill, brow of that hill was the Son of God. And they were rejecting all these blessings that he said he'd come to give. They were rejecting salvation. If he'd come to damn and to blast and to destroy, we can understand their antagonism, but he has come to bless. Never were more gracious words uttered than these, and yet they say away with him. What is this? Well, I suggested it was what the Bible calls unbelief. That's the trouble. Unbelief. And my point last Sunday was that unbelief is not a matter of intellect, it's a matter of state or condition. I showed you from this record that unbelief is a state and an attitude of soul imposed upon us by the devil, which manifests a terrible power. It can grip us and control us. It leads to passion. It produces prejudice and hatred and wrath. And it works upon our pride and through our pride. That was the trouble with these people. But there it was in general. And I said that this evening, God willing, we'd come on to deal with it in particular. And now I'm proceeding to do so. This state of unbelief manifests itself in certain ways. Oh, I do trust that everybody is clear about that first proposition, that it is a state or a condition. There is no such thing as a man in absolute detachment applying his mind to the gospel. It's impossible. Our minds are not detached. A man is not some kind of reasoning machine or animal sitting in a vacuum. No, no. A man's mind is governed by the whole man, his entire personality. That's why we all have prejudices. There is no such thing as a detached objective attitude. There is a saying to the effect, as a man thinks, so he is. It's equally true to say that as a man is, so he thinks. I don't want to waste time with this, but I do trust that we're all clear about that. You know, the world is full of prejudice. It's not only true with regard to the gospel. It's true in every walk and department of life. I can't remember whether I've told you how I read not so long ago a review of Professor Arnold Toynbee's massive history of the world, the study of history, in great ten volumes. A great and learned authority. But I was reading a review of these massive tomes by another professor of history in Oxford. And this is what he said. He said, of course, there's great learning and great erudition shown in these great volumes. But he said he didn't agree at all with the conclusion. He doesn't agree with the thesis. He said, Professor Toynbee started off with a theory and with an idea. And what he's done is to manipulate the facts and force them to fit in with his theory. Now, that isn't a, a non-Christian speaking about a Christian or a Christian about a non-Christian. That's one professional historian speaking about another professional historian. He says it's all right, of course, but uh, what Professor Toynbee's been doing is this. His prejudice has made him make the facts fit into his theory. And of course, exactly the same thing is true of uh, Mr. A.J. B. Taylor, who, who was saying that about Professor Arnold Toynbee. He has a different prejudice. You see, here are two great 
professors of history looking at the identical facts. One says this, that other one says that, and they're diametrically opposed. And yet we are asked to believe that people are not Christians today because with their detached, objective minds and intellects, they can't accept it. My dear friend, it's got nothing to do with intellect. Nothing at all. I'm not exaggerating. It has nothing to do with intellect. The fact that the same man at one time of his life denied it and later believes it proves it isn't intellect. It's something else. And that is this state or condition that even governs the mind and insinuates a prejudice. Very well, but I'm saying that this prejudice manifests itself in certain specific uh, respects. And I just want to show you three of them as they're indicated very clearly in this passage with which we are dealing. Here's the first. This condition always brings up in our mind the question of understanding. Of course, you see, it's coupled with that idea of intellect. Now, there are large numbers of people outside Christ and outside the Christian faith and the church tonight because they say they cannot understand this or that. And because they don't understand, they say they will not believe. They say they cannot believe. They say, I don't believe anything which I don't understand. That's to commit intellectual suicide. If I subscribe to a thing though I don't understand it, I'm being a fool. What's the value of my brain, my understanding? They don't understand, therefore they reject. Now that was exactly the trouble with these people. You see, here was their problem. Jesus, the carpenter, has come back. He's been away. He stood up and he read and he spoke and expounded. And they were moved, they were impressed, they were shaken, they all bear him witness. And But then they said, but wait a minute, we've got to be rather careful here, we're being carried away. He's played on our feelings. We were almost on the point of saying that this is the Messiah, he's Joseph's son, he's Jesus. They say the thing's impossible. When we first looked at him and when we heard him, we said, this must be the long-expected Messiah. But of course, it can't be. How can this one person be at one and the same time the carpenter, the son of Joseph, and the Messiah? Impossible. And because they couldn't understand it, they rejected it, and they rejected him. It baffled them. Let's grant it was a tremendous problem. Jesus, whom they knew so well, He'd been there all his life. And he had always been with them and had worked amongst them. But suddenly there's something different. He seems to be two men at one and the same time. But they say that sort of thing can't happen. He is Jesus. He's never been trained as a Pharisee. He hasn't got learning. He can't have because he's never been taught. It's only Jesus after all. And because they couldn't understand him, they rejected him. There is the whole case. It's still the same, isn't it? There are people who say, I can't be a Christian because at the very outset you confront me with certain propositions that I can't accept because I don't understand them. You preach one called Jesus of Nazareth and you ask us to believe that at one and the same time he was man and God. You say two natures in one person, distinct, separate, in union, but not intermingled. And I don't understand a thing like that, says the man. I can't get this idea of two natures in one person. Sounds monstrous to me. If you said he was a man, the greatest man the world's ever known, I'd follow him, I'd believe in him. But you ask me to believe he's God at the same time. That he's the everlasting son of God, without beginning, coming from eternity into time. I can't believe it. I don't understand such talk. And then they say you talk to us about miracles. Your New Testament, your Gospels are full of miracles. You tell us that he could turn water into wine, that he could walk on the sea, that he could raise the dead and do various other things. 
I don't believe in miracles. I'm a scientist. I've got a scientific mind. I believe in cause and effect. And there are no such thing as miracles. So I can't be a Christian. I can't believe. I don't understand this claim of the miraculous. They don't understand miracles, they say. And therefore they cannot be Christians. And then they say, you always bring us to that cross. You have your communion service with your bread and your wine. You say this is the center of your message. You ask us to believe that that one man dying was dying for all. That the death of one somehow bore the sins of many. And that somehow by dying there upon that cross he was saving us. We don't understand things like that, they say. That isn't our idea of life. That's not our understanding of human nature or the ways of men. Oh, I mustn't keep you with these illustrations, but I'm mentioning the ones that seem to stumble so many. And here's another. People say, God's will. I don't understand it. I don't understand his permissive will. At one and the same time you ask us to say and to believe that God is love and then I see spastic children. I see wars and pestilences and famines and I can't understand these things. If your God is what you say he is, why does he allow things like this? I can't reconcile them. They can't understand this. And many are stumbled even by the question of prayer. They say if God knows everything, what's the point of praying? What's the value of it? Now, if you want a technical term, what they say is this. There are these antinomies, these things which appear to be utter opposites. And yet you Christians, they say, you blend them, you make them one. You ask us to take them both together. The antinomies of the Christian faith. And men reject him still as they rejected him in the synagogue of Nazareth. Because they don't understand Messiah and Joseph, son, impossible. What's the answer? Well, the answer, my friends, could be a very long one. I'm only going to give you some headings. Here is one. It's a very general argument. And it is that life itself would be quite impossible and insupportable if we didn't accept things that we don't understand. I mean by that something like this. Do you understand the sun in the heavens? Do you know all about it? Do you understand its working? The world is full of mystery. The whole universe is mysterious. Sir James Jeans writes his book, The Mysterious Universe. Well, if you insist upon understanding exactly and in detail, before you're prepared to use anything or to have any benefits from it, I say, and I'm not trying to be funny, if you press that argument to its logic in a world like this, you ought to commit suicide. Because you don't understand your universe, and yet you go on living in it. But wait a minute, there's something much more important than this. Isn't it obvious from the very beginning that this cannot be a matter of understanding primarily? I'll tell you why I say that. If to be a Christian is primarily a matter of understanding, well then it is grossly unfair. It's unfair for this reason. There are some people who are very clever. They're born with great brains and they can take in knowledge. They can mop it up. There are others who can't and they haven't got the time. They're perhaps uh, working at home with a house full of children and a husband to look after and the washing and the cooking and all the rest of it. If they are to understand to be saved, well, I say they're lost, they're hopeless. If it were a matter of understanding, foreign mission work would be utterly monstrous and ridiculous. But thank God it isn't a matter of understanding. It isn't understanding that saves. It isn't my understanding of these great mysteries that saves me. It's my believing them, accepting them, and yielding myself to them. Oh, well, let me put it then like this. Here is a very good reason why it isn't a question of understanding. The things about which I'm speaking are so great and so transcendent and so glorious 
that no human understanding can possibly arise to them. If we can't understand electricity, how can we understand God and holiness and heaven and the two natures in the one person and the three persons in the blessed Holy Trinity? Oh, the Apostle Paul with his gigantic brain comes to us and he says, Great is the mystery of godliness. He knew more about it than anybody else, but he didn't understand it. He bows before it, the mystery of it all. God was manifest in the flesh. Who can understand a thing like that? It isn't to be understood. It's too great. It's too glorious. It's too transcendent. Yes, and especially when you add this final point to it all, that our natures are sinful and all our faculties are sinful. Our minds are sinful. You see, we saw that last Sunday evening with this prejudice, this blindness, all seems yellow to the jaundiced eye. He can't help himself, poor fellow. Everything isn't yellow, but he says it is. Why? Well, the jaundice is in his eye. Everything's colored. We're all like that. We're all tarnished by sin. Our very minds are not functioning as they should be. And yet with our sinful minds, we say, if I don't understand God, I won't believe him. Lunatic. Monster of iniquity. Fool that thou art. It is the fool that ever says in his heart, there is no God, simply because he doesn't understand. But look at the tragedy of it all as you see it depicted in these people in the synagogue of Nazareth. Because they don't understand the mystery of Jesus and Christ, man and God, the two natures in the one person. Because they can't understand it. They try to murder him and to get rid of him. Was there ever greater folly? Was there ever a greater tragedy? My dear friend, just think for a moment, think reasonably and rationally and see that you're doomed to failure at the very beginning. You'll never understand God, even if you go to heaven and gaze upon him to all eternity. He is the absolute and the eternal, the all and in all. But come, let me say a word about the second matter. These people were not only stumbled by the fact that they couldn't understand. They were obviously also stumbled at our Lord's actions. You see, he reads their minds. When they said, is not this Joseph's son? You remember what he said. This is what he said to them. You will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in this thy country. What's it mean? It means this. They had heard that he had been working great miracles in Capernaum, but he hadn't done so at Nazareth. And they felt that he ought to have done so. He isn't doing what they thought he ought to be doing. They had heard about all this, so they were expecting miracles, expecting signs, and he didn't give them, and hence their annoyance and their final wrath. This was always a source of trouble, wasn't it? Did you notice what we read together out of the seventh chapter of John's Gospel? His own brethren couldn't understand him at this point. They said, look here, we don't understand you, Jesus. You say that you've come to manifest yourself and yet you're hiding yourself. They said, don't you know that this great feast of tabernacles is starting at Jerusalem? Why don't you go up there? If you've come to do what you say you've come to do, why not go up and declare yourself? What are you staying here for? We are going up. Why don't you go up? Even his own brethren felt he wasn't doing what he ought to be doing. They didn't believe in him. It was the trouble with the whole nation of the Jews. 
He didn't seem to be doing what they thought the Messiah ought to do. They were always asking him for a sign, for some marvel. The devil had had already started it all there. You remember away in the wilderness? If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that they be bred. Give me a proof. Let me take you to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and throw you down and God's angels will save you. You'll give a proof by doing that. Give a sign. And so on. They were always asking him for a sign. So he said of them, This wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonas. Oh, another thing they expected was this. They've got their great political ideas. When he came, was that he'd be a great king and that he'd collect a great army and lead them against their Roman oppressors and set the country free again. But Jesus didn't seem to be doing it. He was spending his time in Galilee instead of being up in Jerusalem. Indeed, we are told on one occasion, after he had worked the miracle of feeding the 5,000, they came and they tried to take him by force to make him a king. But he extricated himself from them and went up into a mountain himself alone. Another occasion, you remember, he was preaching and preaching a very wonderful sermon, telling them about their relationship to God and God's love to them. And the moment he stopped to take breath, a man shouted out and said, Master, speak to my brother that he share the inheritance with me. And he turned to that man and said, Man, who made me a judge or a divider among you? That man thought that he'd come to settle social problems and be a materialist and a kind of politician and a judge and a divider. That's what he ought to be doing, but he wouldn't do it. Well, if you read through the pages of the four Gospels, you'll find that they've got many ideas as to what he ought to be doing and what he ought to be saying, but he doesn't seem to be doing it. And because he doesn't, they hate him and they reject him. He ought to be working miracles. He's here, they said, as well as there. And because he doesn't, what is this? It's still the cause of trouble. I can't be a Christian, says someone. Because if your message is right and your Jesus is what you claim him to be, why hasn't he abolished war? Why hasn't he produced universal peace? Your gospel has been preached for nearly 2,000 years and it doesn't seem to be touching this problem at all. You're always preaching about personal salvation and sin and redemption and heaven and hell. Why aren't you doing something about the present position? They want Christ to give them some sort of international peace. They think the business of Christ and of Christianity is to deal with political situations and matters. That he is to speak on industrial problems and produce better relationships. They say your gospel doesn't seem to be doing anything. There are the problems. Why not tackle them? He doesn't seem to. It's still the same trouble, you see. But he doesn't do that kind of thing. When he was here on earth, he spent his time preaching to poor people. He spent a great deal of his time away up in Galilee. There he spoke to them and taught them and sat with publicans and sinners He didn't set himself up as king. He didn't start a political agitation. He didn't start a political movement. He did none of these things. He seemed to be hiding himself always. And everybody remonstrated with him and were trying to push him to do something else. And he wouldn't. He healed the sick. He gave comfort to those who were afflicted. And then finally... Instead of defying his enemies in apparent weakness and utter helplessness, he suffered himself to be arrested and tried and condemned and treated ignominiously and spurned and spat upon 
and nailed to a tree, and in utter weakness he died. And they stood looking at him and said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. What's the value of all this preaching and all this talk? He isn't doing what he ought to be doing. If thou be the Son of God, save thyself, come down from that cross. But he didn't do it. So they said, he claimed to be the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Monstrous and utterly ridiculous. Ah, that has always been the stumbling block, hasn't it? That has always been the offense. Men think they know what Christ ought to be doing and he isn't doing it. He's doing something else. Ah, they say your blood and your death and your sin. I'm not interested. I'm a practical man of affairs. I want to know what about peace and war and all these other matters. But he followed his own way. Miracles in Capernaum, not in Nazareth. He's got a plan. He set a course. He follows it. He sets his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. His own disciples try to plead with him not to go. He said, I must. Oh, it was like that while he was here. And it was like that afterwards. There's an illustration of it all in the very earliest days of the Christian church, which I always feel is not, one, not only wonderful, but in a sense displays the divine humor. Peter and John go up to the temple to pray, and there's a man seated at the beautiful gate of the temple, lame from his mother's womb. He'd never walked in his life, and there he is, begging alms. He's sitting on the pavement, paralyzed, with his cap by his side, expecting people to throw in something. And Peter and John come along, they're going into the temple to pray, and he looked at them, expecting to receive something out of them. And Peter, looking at him with John, fastened his eyes upon him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He expected silver and gold. They say, we haven't got it, but what we have got we'll give, and they gave. Whether you and I like it or not, my friends, the business of the Christian church is not to deal with political and social questions. You may say to me, look at this man, Archbishop Makarios. Why does he interfere in politics? Why doesn't he do his own job as a churchman? I agree a hundred percent with you. But with great respect, I would say the same thing to the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Chichester. I am not called to preach politics and social conditions. I am here to preach the gospel that my blessed Lord preached before me. A gospel of salvation. A gospel to the individual. You see, when you've settled the problem of Cyprus, you will still be a sinner. How easy to get excited about Cyprus. How offensive to have to face yourself in the life. How easy to wax eloquent about the sanctity of contracts between nations or groups of nations. But how offensive to be asked to face your own marriage vows and your own personal purity and chastity. But that is what this gospel is about. I don't understand these great international questions. I'm not commissioned to deal with them. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, he tells us, to save sinners. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost.
He didn't come to be crowned as a king with a crown of gold. He came to be crowned with a crown of thorns. He came to die. He came to taste death for every man. He said, the Son of Man is not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He came deliberately to die because it was only by dying for men and their sins he could save their souls and reconcile them to God. These people were stumbled at that. Men and women are still stumbled at it. And that brings me to my last point, which I just mentioned. These people in the synagogue of Nazareth objected also to the idea of grace. You see, their whole approach to him was wrong, and that's why he spoke so severely to them. They felt that they had a right to make demands of him. They said, look here, you've worked miracles there, why don't you hear? They come with a demand, they present a bill. And he replies by making it very plain and clear to them that as long as they're in that frame of mind and in that attitude, he has nothing at all to give them except condemnation. He puts it in this way. He said at the time of that great famine, which lasted three and a half years, there were many widows in Israel. But God didn't send Elias to any one of them. He sent him unto a widow of Sarepta, a city of Sidon. And in the same way, he said, in the time of Elisha, the prophet, there were many lepers in Israel, but God didn't send him unto any one of them. He sent him unto Naaman, a Syrian. And Israel doesn't like this, but it isn't a question of what Israel likes or wants or expects. It is God who gives. It is God who decides. And by speaking as he did there at that point, our Lord is making that abundantly clear. Look here, he said to his fellow townsmen of Nazareth, if you are making demands and saying, we have a right to this, I have nothing. Didn't you hear me when I said just now, he seems to say, that I have come to preach the gospel to the poor, if you think you've got any claim upon God and his love tonight, you'll never know his grace. We are all sinners and we have no rights in the presence of God. We can't demand, demand anything. We can't present any bill. That you come to him and say, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross. I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. If you come to Christ standing on your feet and presenting demands, you'll get nothing but what these people had in Nazareth. He'll rebuff you. He'll reject you. He'll condemn you. But if you come to him in utter helplessness and hopelessness, realizing your emptiness and woe, he'll give you everything. Come unto me, he says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He invites the thirsty, the hungry, the, he, the sick, the hopeless, the helpless. If you come, I say again, standing erect in terms of demands and rights, you'll get nothing.
and let us go to him, acknowledging that we have no claims, no rights, but that we have seen that we are sinners in the sight of God. Let us emulate the example of the publican who went up into the temple to pray. And who was so conscious of his misery and his wretchedness, he couldn't even lift up his face to heaven, but simply cried, saying, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. That man went down to his house justified. Not the righteous. Sinners, Jesus came to save. Do you remember our Lord's parable of the workers in the vineyard? He, where the, the, the employer went out early in the day, he saw some men standing idle. He said, go and work in my vineyard and I'll give you a penny for it. Off they went. Hours later he went out again and saw another group, sent them in the same way and on the same terms. He went out at the eleventh hour and there were still some men standing idle. And he said, why don't you go and work? Go in and I'll give you a penny. And they went in and worked. Then the time came and the master went to pay them. And he called, first of all, those who had gone into the vineyard at the eleventh hour. And he, he gave them a penny. And then they came all in turn. And then came, finally, the people who had gone in at the very beginning. And he gave them a penny also. And they looked at him and they said, look here, what's this? You gave a penny to the people who only worked for an hour. And are you only giving a penny to us who have borne the heat and the burden of the day? This is scandalous, they said. Look here, we must have more. Five or six times what you've given them. Even ten times. And our Lord had to tell them the same thing. Is thine eye evil because I am good, he says. Have I done you any wrong by being gracious to these lost? Can't I do as I like with my own? That's grace. Did you know this, my friend, that if God were not a God of grace, every one of us would be damned. There'd be no hope for any, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've no right to ask anything. You've insulted God. You've ignored him. You've put your will before him. You've turned your back upon him. He's told you in your conscience not to do something. You've done it deliberately. That's how you've treated him. And you haven't thanked him for your blessings. And yet you think you've got a claim upon him. It is of God's mercy only that we are not all consumed. God can do as he likes with his own and he will. His son worked miracles in Capernaum, not in Nazareth. Do you know why he didn't work miracles in Nazareth? I'll tell you. He knew the people. He knew their attitude. And he knew that unless that was broken down, there was no hope for them. If he'd worked miracles, they'd have stood on admiring and expressing their criticisms. He knew the trouble. He had to break them down. And we all must be broken down. There is only one key, if I may so put it, that opens the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the key of repentance, the key of the acknowledgement of sin, the key that makes a man say, I have nothing, have mercy upon me. That he finds irresistible. And he always responds and showers down of the riches of his grace. Oh, may God open our eyes to the tragedy of rejecting him because we don't understand him and what he does, because he doesn't do what we think he ought to do, and because he asks us to come to him as suppliants on bended knee, realizing our desperate need. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, 
that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.